Hello, this is Ms. Augustine, and today we are going to begin Chapter 6, which is about chemical bonding. So let's begin our introduction to chemical bonding and talk about what we mean by chemical bond. A chemical bond is defined as that mutual electrical attraction between the nuclei and valence electrons of different atoms that tends to bind the atoms together. And valence electrons are those in the outermost energy level, so the outermost electrons. And there are two types of bonding that we'll talk about. Ionic bonding, uh, which is bonding that results from the electrical attraction between anions and cations. And the way you get anions and cations is that somebody gained electrons, anions, and somebody lost electrons, forming cations. And the second type is covalent bonding, and that results from the sharing of electron pairs between two atoms. So we've already talked about periodic trends, and we've talked about a really important one, which is electronegativity. And so the electronegativity ultimately is going to decide when two atoms encounter one another, two or more atoms, whether they're just going to bounce off of each other or whether one of them is going to gain electrons from the other one, one is going to lose electrons to another one, or if their electronegativity is so similar that they're going to have a kind of tug of war where they're sharing the electrons between them. So what decides whether it's ionic or covalent? So the bonding that occurs between atoms of different elements is rarely purely one or the other. It's rarely purely ionic or purely covalent. What ends up happening is you have a degree of ionic or covalent bonding, and that is determined by the electronegativity differences of these elements. And you'll recall we saw in the uh, chapter about periodic law, we saw that uh, there's a scale for electronegativity, the Pauling scale of electronegativity, and electronegativity ranges from 0 to 4.0 with fluorine having the highest electronegativity of any element on the periodic table. So that difference in electronegativity is what determines what happens with the electrons. So a truly pure nonpolar covalent bond occurs when the difference in electronegativity is between 0 and 0 0.4. A polar covalent bond, which uh, the prime example is water, where the difference in electronegativity is enough so that the electrons are spending more of their time on one atom than another. And so a polar covalent bond occurs when the difference in electronegativity is between 0 0.4 and 1.7. And again, that's using electronegativity on the Pauling scale. So then, when the difference in electronegativity is great enough, you end up with an ionic bond. So generally speaking, if the difference in electronegativity is greater than 1.7, then somebody's going to get the electrons and somebody's going to lose the electrons, and that would be an ionic bond. So for covalent bonding, if we're talking about nonpolar covalent bonds, there's slight to no difference in the element's electronegativities, again, between 0 and 0 0.4. And so the purely nonpolar covalent uh, bond would be in atoms that are bonded to themselves. So the electronegativity difference would be 0. So chlorine with itself, or hydrogen with itself, or oxygen with itself. And then a polar covalent bond, again, the difference in the element's electronegativities falls between 0 0.4 and 1.7. And so here's my water example where oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. And so we use a little delta minus and delta plus to indicate that the electrons are spending most of their time on oxygen, so it's got a slightly negative charge. And they're spending very little of their time on hydrogen, and so the hydrogens are slightly positively charged, because remember, hydrogen is just one proton in the nucleus and one electron surrounding it. So this is a polar covalent bonding example, and we end up, because of the molecular geometry here, with also a polar molecule. There's a negative side and a positive side. 
So molecules, when we're talking about molecular compounds, we're referring to those that have covalent bonding. They are made up of molecules, which is a neutral group of atoms held together by covalent bonds. And what uh, they are made of are nonmetal, nonmetal elements. So nonmetal, nonmetal bonds are covalent. And molecular compounds are chemical compounds whose simplest unit is a molecule. And again, since covalent bonding involves the sharing of electrons over two or more atoms, then you have a, a molecule that forms because they're all kind of stuck together because they're sharing these electrons. So a molecular formula then shows you the types and numbers of atoms combined in a single molecule of a molecular compound. So for instance, on the previous slide I showed you two chlorines bonded together. That would be Cl2, showing me that there's two chlorines involved. And with water, H2O, we know that there are two hydrogens bonded to one oxygen. And so then we talk about some special molecules, and these are the diatomic elements. So there's a group of elements that naturally exist as two atoms covalently bonded together. That is to say, you're not going to find hydrogen hanging out by itself anywhere. It exists as H2, a diatomic molecule. And there's nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And I will show you on the periodic table um, when we're doing this together in class that you can find them on the periodic table by looking for nitrogen and it forms a 7 on the periodic table and we can also do it by remembering a funny word Brinkelhoff that contains all seven of the diatomic elements. So what this means is that later on in the year when we start to do chemical reactions if you're asked to write the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen to form water for instance you can't write H plus O yields H2O. You have to show that hydrogen only exists as H2, oxygen only exists as O2, so you would write it H2 plus O2 yields H2O, and then you could talk about balancing it as well. So now we have to talk a little bit about bond length and energy. Bond length is the average distance between two bonded atoms and bond energy is the energy that is required to break a chemical bond to form neutral isolated atoms again. And they are measured in kilojoules per mole. And for example, a hydrogen-hydrogen bond takes 436 kilojoules per mole to break. And table one um, on page 182 in our textbook has bond energies um, for a whole bunch of things um, that you can check out. Later on this year when we get to chapter 16 I think it is, we will actually be calculating how much uh, energy is required when you're making a chemical reaction and so we'll talk about the bond energies for each of the compounds involved in a chemical reaction. But for now, just know that the bond energy is the energy required to break a chemical bond and form the neutral isolated atoms again. So for now, I think I'm going to leave it here. This is Ms. Augustine signing off, and we will pick up with this in a little bit with part two for chapter six. So again, this is Ms. Augustine signing off.